Hello and welcome to another episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, coming to you live from Johannesburg, South Africa. And joining me tonight are two of my outstanding co-hosts for our first ever team effort in hosting a Conservation Conversations webinar. A big welcome to Christina Hagen, all the way from a chilly Cape Town, and Andrew de Bloch from an equally chilly Wackerstrom. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Tonight we're doing something a little bit different with the compilation of highlights reel from this year's Virtual African Bird Fair. A brilliant idea by Christina, and we certainly hope all of you will enjoy tonight's show. Each of us has picked our top moments across the fair, and we'll be sharing snippets and discussions around these over the next hour or so. But before we play tonight's webinar, please remember that you can communicate with us using the Zoom chat room. And any questions that you may have as we go along can, you, can be posted in the Q&A chat box. If you happen to be watching us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions. And we'll get to these at the end of the webinar. We're active on all social media channels, so please use the hashtag Conservation Conversations to get in touch with us. All of our previous episodes are available on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel. And thanks to everyone who has subscribed to our channel. If you're enjoying our webinar series, and we certainly hope you are, and you can afford to support it financially, every little bit helps us to keep this webinar free for all to learn and enjoy. Simply scan the Quicket QR code on screen or visit our Conservation Conversations website to find the link to the donations tab. A big thank you to every single one of you who has managed to donate to us so far this year. And now a pretty incredible announcement there are no tickets left for our jackpot birding raffle. They are all sold out. So a huge thank you to all of you who supported this important fundraiser. And we will be announcing the winner of this uh, really in, uh, exciting raffle just later this year. And uh, now our, our Conservation League donor competition is ending tonight. So you still have a few hours to show your commitment to conservation by signing up and standing a chance of winning a four night stay for two at Zamanga Private Game Reserve in Northern KwaZulu-Natal. And that's valued at 40,000 Rand. So for more information, please uh, email membership at birdlife.org.za. And uh, we'll announce the winner of that prize next week. We also have an exciting announcement about the popular South Africa Listers Club. Our much awaited milestone pin badges are now available through our online store. Build up your South African flag as you progress through your list milestones with our proudly South African colored pin badges. Reaching a milestone in your birding journey is an achievement worth celebrating. Join BirdLife South Africa in celebrating birds and birding by joining the Listers Club through our website and collect your special milestone badges as you go. Each ba badge is on sale for just 75 Rand and can be purchased at shop.birdlife.org.za. Talking about proudly South African birding, you can join BirdLife South Africa and Eco Training for Birding Big Day in the exclusive Makuleke area of the Northern Kruger National Park in November. November is arguably the best time of year, in fact, to be birding this magical destination. You can expect twice daily game drives and or walks with expert bird and wildlife guides and you can expect to see specials like racket-tailed rollers, three-banded courses, pals fishing owl, honest chat, and many more, all at, at all-inclusive rates that will never be seen again. Make sure not to miss out on the limited spaces available and book through Wesley Abrams at projects at ecotraining.co.za. Now, South Africa's grasslands are home to 24 threatened and endemic bird species. However, only 2% of this habitat is formally protected and is under constant threat from alteration and destruction due to, among other things, urbanization, intensive agricultural development, and of course, mining. The proposed Upper Vilcha protected environment lies on the eastern escarpment between the towns of Van Rienen, Harry Smith, and Fadkake of Skop in the Free State and bordering on the well-known Ingula Nature Reserve. Securing the site as a protected area through the biodiversity stewardships, uh, through the biodiversity stewardship efforts of BirdLife South Africa, the Department of Economic and Small Business Development, Tourism and Environment, Environmental Affairs of the Free State Provincial Government, 
the Angula Partnership and the Endangered Wildlife Trust is a vital component to securing species survival and ecological pr provisioning, including all important water sources. Additionally, this work can provide potential public benefits through socioeconomic development related to environmental improvement projects and ecotourism. Well, the 60 day public participation period is ending today, ladies and gentlemen. Please help us to conserve the grasslands and the wetlands by signing our online support form on the BirdLife South Africa website. Now, uh, on to the main event. Uh, we held our virtual African bird fair at the end of July, and it was a fantastic event. Uh, but if I had one criticism, it is that there was too much to, uh, too much to watch. So in case people didn't get to everything, we wanted to give our a conservation conversations audience a taste of what happened at the bird fair. So Melissa, Andrew and I chose some of our favorite clips from the many speakers and, and we pre-recorded um, and stitched these together with some of our commentary about why we chose them. So uh, we hope that you are entertained and inspired. Great, thanks so much both of you. We're gonna kick off with our exciting presentation and we'll be back for questions at the end. Enjoy everybody. Good evening, everybody. BirdLife South Africa has become synonymous with their amazing annual events that they hold every year. And one of the annual favorites is undoubtedly the African Bird Fair. Historically, this event has taken place at the Johannesburg Zoo from over 10 years ago. And in 2014, shifting the location through to Walter Sisulu Botanical Gardens. At these events, we would gather together all of the birding enthusiasts and exhibitors who would showcase their wares and arts and crafts all linked to bird watching and birding and this was a really fun socializing event for many of the birders in the greater Gauteng area. Unfortunately this did limit us to the Gauteng birding population and we really struggled to find ways to engage our birding enthusiasts further afield in South Africa and the global community and we have luckily or not so luckily through COVID-19 had to adapt. And Andrew's gonna tell you a little bit about what happened to the bird fair when the COVID-19 pandemic struck. Yes, so as Melissa says, we, we had to pivot and uh, adapt with the times. For better or worse, we've become a virtual world now. And we took the decision as uh, BirdLife South Africa to uh, not, just, not just to cancel our African bird fair, because it is such a, a loved event by all the birders out there, but to take it to a virtual platform, which was the first uh, step for us and, and quite a uh, daunting one at that. Uh, we had not very much time to plan the 2020 virtual African bird fair, which is the first ever virtual bird fair in Africa as a whole. Uh, but we managed to pull it off. We had a wonderful program from the speakers. We uh, had Peter Harrison come and give a keynote lecture. And it was wonderful and very well received by everyone who was unfortunately stuck at home and, and uh, could feel a part of the birding community through this wonderful virtual bird fair that we were able to put on. And as kind of Melissa intimated, we were able to spread our reach from well beyond the borders of Kaoteng, across South Africa, into Africa, and even the world. So in, in some senses of it, the virtual African bird fair in 2020 was the first truly African bird fair in that people from all over Africa could uh, participate in the bird fair actively as participants, as speakers, as exhibitors, etc. So going to a virtual platform was, a, as I said, a daunting prospect, but something that I think we carried off quite well. We managed to include some of the usual facets of bird fairs, as well as a few exciting new virtual ones. And then rolling around 2021, uh, unfortunately, we were still in the grips of national lockdown and a pandemic globally. And we decided to uh, reprise the virtual African bird fair and held the second ever virtual African bird fair on uh, the 30th and 31st of July 2021. This was a, a day and a half event rather than a two day event. Um, the, the 2020 fair was a one day event. It was so packed with programming and all sorts of activities that people actually asked for more time to enjoy it. So 2021, we had a, a two day event and uh, really enjoyed, again, all the wonderful speakers, all the wonderful interaction and all the wonderful different facets that, you know, Hmm. Okay. Um, so even though we went virtual, we tried to have some of the same 
events and activities as you would expect at the physical bird fair. So we had an auction with a whole bunch of different uh, lots on offer that was very popular. And we also had virtual exhibition stands where um, birding optics companies and uh, tour companies could uh, have a, a stand where people could interact with them through the virtual platform. But something that was new uh, to the virtual world was a, a, a fun game where people had to explore the platform to find answers to various questions. And this was a great way to get people familiar with this new platform and technology and uh, to, to learn a little bit about uh, how it all worked and see all the content, because there was certainly a lot of content. Yeah, so there certainly was a lot going on. And uh, I think even for people that did manage to attend, uh, they certainly couldn't have watched all of it. There were often two or three things going on at the same time. And plenty of you missed out, unfortunately, through uh, often no fault of your own. I know load shedding was a certain demon doing the rounds at the time. So we thought we'd put some of the, the best of the bird fair highlights together for you to watch um, going through the day. And I think there's no better place to start than the opening ceremony at which uh, Mark Anderson invited the Deputy Director General Judy Beaumont from the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment to officially open the bird fair for us. And this is some of what she had to say. It's a great pleasure for me to um, welcome you all to the Virtual African Bird Fair. I um, really finally arrived. Um, so we're very pleased to be here and I'd like to thank you all for your attendance. Okay, then it gives me great pleasure now to introduce um, Judy Beaumont, who's a DDG at the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. We've invited um, Judy to say a few words as part of this opening ceremony. Judy, thank you very, very much for your time. We really appreciate all the, the collaborations with your department um, and with you in particular, and we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Judy. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here and um, very honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It is my great pleasure to attend the opening ceremony of BirdLife South Africa's Virtual African Bird Fair. And I'd like to commend BirdLife South Africa for convening their second virtual bird fair. The pandemic has presented extreme challenges to all South Africans, including to conservation non-government organizations. And it is therefore impressive to see that BirdLife South Africa has adapted to the current circumstances. In South Africa, it is encouraging to see the growth in birding with people of all races and ages taking up this important pursuit. Birding is a hobby that is accessible to everyone. This is especially true in our country where birds can be accessed in our cities and towns, which still have many green areas within them. With a little effort of traveling to our rural and wild areas, birds are really accessible and is often a gateway to a greater appreciation um, of the environment and of conservation. BirdLife South Africa and the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment have an excellent working relationship. And this includes the important Miles Free Marion project, efforts to conserve the embattled African penguin, the development of renewable energy guidelines and the training and support of departmental officials, the sterling efforts to reduce seabird bycatch in South Africa's fisheries, and also assistance with our country's efforts to implement our obligations to various international conventions, including Ramsar, the Convention on Biodiversity and the World Heritage Convention. I'm a strong supporter of the efforts of civil society, especially considering that there is so much work that needs to be undertaken in our country to grow our economy, support development and protect our country's natural heritage. I commend BirdLife South Africa uh, for important work and contribution to our country and her people. I'm pleased to deliver this opening address at the Virtual African Bird Fair and wish you a productive and enjoyable two days. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so thanks to uh, Judy Beaumont for those very kind words. Uh, I know we, we had um, originally had Minister Creasy down to talk, but of course she is a lady with many responsibilities on her plate. So we're very grateful for Judy and uh, for, for representing the department in her stead. 
And as I said, for all those very kind words, we really do value that relationship that we have with government. And after having the Minister of Tourism open our first ever virtual African bird fair, how wonderful to have a representative from the Department of Forestry, uh, Fisheries and the Environment for our second bird fair. Our first speaker is probably no stranger to the birding world. Uh, Fancy Peacock is a well-known birder and author of, of bird books and also illustrator. Um, he illustrated the latest edition of the Cecil bird book. And he, he opened the bird fair in great fashion with a, a historical look at what makes birders tick. Um, so another skill that birders um, excel at is letting other birders know where a particular bird is. Um, and as such, we can descri describe completely inanimate objects like rocks and trees and bushes and mountains with um, the precision of a German engineer. And of course, the rarer the bird is, the greater the pressure to get all the other birders onto it. Um, so this is the point where there's an instant um, distinction between a birder and a non-birder through sort of vocal and behavioral characters. Okay, so, so a non-birder would, would almost invariably point frantically, uh, which invariably causes the bird to flush, um, which is to say to fly away, not, not to finish up in the loose. Um, or they can say one of the worst possible things, it's there or it's right there, or it's out in the open. And then of course, oh, it's gone. It just flew. Rather, a good birding mate would um, dive uh, deep into those long hours in preschool where they learned shapes and colors. And a typical scenario would, would go something like this. Do you see the green tree? Um, which green tree? The jade green or the emerald green? No, 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 the green trapezoid one, the teal green one. Okay, so you go up with the main trunk then you take the second big fork to the left. Then it splits again. Um, and there are some lichens that look like octagons. Have you got it? No, 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 no. It's the, is it the diagonal fork or the more horizontal fork? So some of the, the best descriptions that I've heard, and these are, are the Baitum true quotes, um, were, it's by the rock that looks like a triangular square. So what on earth is a triangular square? Okay, the second one is, um, it's, it's by the cow with a map of Madagascar on its side. So all birders are obsessive and almost, uh, they have an almost autistic fondness for making lists. And we've perfected it to a science. Um, and okay, so for the uninitiated, I'll start with the very basics. Okay, you write down a list of birds that you saw. You can then subdivide that list in various ways. So let's start with geography. Okay, so you could say your world list your Southern African list, your South Africa list, your provincial list, um, your garden list, and then the garden list you can even divide into birds that you see in the garden and birds that you see from the garden, right? Okay, you can also apply a time period to your listing. Um, <clears throat> so a typical one would be the trip list, of which the inverse is the target list, okay? You could have a year list, a day list, or the big boy, your life list. And by the way, birders, birders we don't die, we just finish our life lists. Um, <clears throat> there are also various record types that you can attribute to your list. The first question, and one that causes a lot of psychological turmoil in birders, is whether something is tickable or not. Tickable, how is that even a word? Um, and what does it mean? Uh, well, um, forget... Life, uh, forget relationships and true love and making a difference in the world. Life is or what makes uh, life worth living, but only if they're tickable. Okay, so um, birds that are not tickable would be things that have escaped from cap captivity or species that are um, pending taxonomic splits or lumps um, and have not yet been accepted by some committee of bird nerds. Okay, so if they are split, then you get, you get what is called an armchair tick, which sort of implies that when birders are not outbirding, they're sitting in armchairs. Um, but if all these lists are not quite enough to, uh, to satisfy your OCD, many people also uh, create their own lists. Um, and really, your imagination is the only limit. Birds that I've seen from the bathroom window, birds that I've seen while driving to work, birds that I've seen on TV, birds that my cats have caught. 
uh, birds that I've seen while traveling at more than 100 kilometers an hour, which is how I will die, by the way, one day, uh, and birds that I've dreamed about. Um, this, this one is mine. In fact, last night I added uh, a go-away bird, although in retrospect that might have been my wife just commenting on, on my snoring. Um, at one stage I got my, my actuary uh, brother, actuary, not actually, I'm pretty sure he is my brother, uh, to do a little calculation for me. So by factoring in the average lifespan of a birder um, on all the various lists I keep, uh, he came up with a total of 4,371 lists in your lifetime. And of course this necessitates an additional list, which is the list of lists. Uh, and incidentally that's what LOL stands for, right? If you ever, in an important situation, we have to concentrate, say you're on a, on a first date or a, on a, in a court hearing or something like that, my advice is always choose a seat that's not facing a window, right? Um, or like when you're sitting, sitting down for a job interview. Um, yes, I believe I'm the, the perfect candidate for the job. Uh, my biggest weakness? Probably that I work too hard, whereas you're actually thinking that your biggest weakness is turns, or maybe non-reading weavers. Um, I would describe myself as detail-orientated, meticulous, a good observer. Hobbies? Uh, nothing too serious. I do kind of like making lists. Um, where do I see myself in five years? Well, probably... Raptor! 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 So if you're thinking that all of this sounds a bit ridiculous and freakish. There is hope for you yet, but if it sounds pretty normal to you, then I have some bad news and you will never lead a normal life. You will be a bird brain, just like me, just like all the other people signed in and listening today. And you will be until the day in which you finish your life list. Thank you. Christina, you're the, you're the Let's say the newest bird of the three of us. <laughs> do, you, do you feel fancy spoke to some of your character traits or are you still one of those who's off the hook? <laughs> uh, definitely the list. I have uh, many, <laughs> many lists. <laughs> I, I think I need a list of lists. Um, so I'm a, I'm a volunteer firefighter and I've now got a list of birds that I've seen while I'm doing training for firefighting as well as while I'm actually on a fire. Uh, once I'm, you know, in a safe area, I'm not getting too distracted. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Andrew, what are some of your weirdest lists that you've kept? Um, my, probably my list of birds that I've seen in dreams. So I'm at uh, just over 150 species now in about two years. So quite proud of that. And uh, I have a funny system where if uh, friends of mine who also keep dream lists, um, go birding with me in their dreams and I see the birds in their dreams then my dream self has also seen that bird so I can add it to my list so it's very complicated but uh, yeah it gets you excited before you go to bed for what you might dream about it's like inception birding <laughs> exactly <laughs> Uh, that's fantastic. I have to admit, I'm probably one of the worst listers in the country. Uh, while I do attempt to to have a very valid life list, I'm very bad at keeping track of my not so legitimate ones outside of that. But I do try and remember when I've seen a bird on the highway and add it to my 120k an hour list. And much like Fancy, I may one day end up uh, closing down my life list on the highways. <laughs> It certainly is very distracting when you see a beautiful raptor or something flying by and you give yourself that twitcher whiplash. <laughs> but yes, definitely um, when it comes to being a bird brain and a bird nerd, there is always that initial newbie phase. And I'm sure many of you have been recruited into this beautiful hobby of ours through your incredible spark birds or by crazy bird nerd friends. I know I've certainly made it my mission to uh, infiltrate the minds and hobbies and after hours activities of everyone I cross paths with. And uh, I'd like to say I'm slowly converting many more birders into the proverbial flock. And I'm sure Andrew and Christine are doing exactly the same thing with anyone who crosses their paths. But uh, as every good birder needs to start somewhere, 
we certainly are spoiled to have people like Lance Robinson who give us some unbelievably good techniques and courses into the birding basics and, and going to share some of the amazing things that Lance shared in his two hour workshop at this year's Virtual African Bird Fair with all of you now. Okay, so it really helps to um, use several of the key steps that I'm going to discuss in the coming slides for each bird that you're trying to identify. So here yeah, they come, they, what we have termed the seven habits of effective birders. And you might want to make a quick note here before I unpack each of these steps in the coming slides. You may ask yourself, what is the general size? Remember, I'm going to unpack these as we go. What is the general shape? What are the plumage colors and patterns? An important step here. What color and shape is the bull? What color are the legs? And we also ask you just to make a note of the feet. Number six, what habitat is it in? And then number seven, what is its behavior? So hopefully most of you have got all the seven points done. Let's have a look at them. All right. So. Most importantly, as I mentioned a little earlier, is let the, this point here be your mantra. Look at the bird and look at the bird for as long as you can. So for those of you who know this bird, I'd like to ask you how well do you really know the features that contribute to its ID? Let's just take the approach now, today, this morning, that you're a visiting birder to South Africa. Perhaps you're just settling in at a local bed and breakfast Travel is open again, at least locally. Perhaps you're just drinking a cup of coffee or tea on the patio and a movement catches your eye. Perhaps maybe in this instance, you were even lucky enough just to quickly snap a picture of the bird at the bottom of the garden. Um, this is quite a confiding bird, hanging around, um, spending time in the garden, and now you need to know how do I go about IDing this bird? Okay, so in, in the upcoming lesson, I wanted to share the steps, as I mentioned, for you to build up your own bird watching toolbox. The, the primary object of this exercise is to look primarily at the size and shape, any color patterns and markings, but also to make a note of, it, of, of behavior. It's a very important point, and it's a little bit difficult to animate it here, but obviously birds are living creatures. Think of all of these following points as clues that you'll mix and match to hone in on a positive ID when you encounter something that's unfamiliar in the birding world. I actually did Lance's course uh, a couple of months ago before the bird fair um, and found it really useful. Um, and I think the, the big takeaway for me was actually look at the bird. It sounds silly. I mean, what else are you doing when you're, you're bird watching? <laughs> but um, just to actually take the time and really look at the bird properly before diving into your bird book or your app um, I found especially as someone who doesn't you know is still getting to to know the birds a lot knowing what features to actually look at to distinguish the species is is important absolutely and I feel like it's almost that natural pro progression once you're sort of comfortable with those automatic features that make a bird whatever species it is that we're, we're looking at you can then start delving a bit deeper how do you tell males and females apart mm -hmm. is it a juvenile what are the, the sort of more advanced features? You almost level up in your birding once you've got those basic features down. But I think if, if anyone's out there wanting to discover the South Africa's next rarity, this is your most important step. Look really carefully at those birds because you might describe or sort of discard something that you think is just a plain old Kalahari scrub robin and it actually turns out to be a rufous-tailed scrub robin. Yeah, I don't know if you guys noticed that no, nowhere in Lance's seven steps was uh look at distributions of birds in your bird book. So, you know, I think it was really cool to, to have a reminder, even as someone who considers themselves a fairly advanced and experienced birder, um, and I got something out of that workshop in terms of taking birding back to first principles and actually spending time with the birds is also, I think for me, the most enjoyable part of it. ID, of course, is like a nice challenge um, and that's how you grow your lists and, and that's how you become crazy like Fancy. But, you know, looking at the bird and enjoying the bird for what it is and what it's doing uh, lets you into their world and, and also sometimes also helps you with ID if you pick up little funny behaviors, you know, uh, little wing flicks of familiar chats or the shoulder shrug of the 
dusky lark. You know, those are dead giveaways for the birds. But if you're really looking at your bird book or your app, you miss it. So yeah, I think Lance did a brilliant job and people really uh, enjoyed it. So thanks Lance for that. And I think one, one thing that Lance has mentioned in his workshop is uh, you only need two things to really start your birding career or your birding hobby. And that is a field guide to tell what you're looking at. Um, once of course you've gone through the seven steps and then obviously some binoculars. So I know uh, Lance also discussed uh, binoculars in his talk, but we also had a more advanced discussion with two of the experts in the field, Andrew Weissel, who works for Weiler Distributors here in South Africa, and Dale Forbes from Swarovski Optic, who were also a, a gold sponsor at this year's event. And I sat with them in a wonderful discussion, talking about all things optics, and I clipped out one of the more basic questions that I think is quite uh, foundational to everything burning optics, and then one of the more interesting and more lighthearted moments. So please enjoy this. So, so today on our panel, we're going to discuss some issues affecting binoculars and scopes and other optical equipment and accessories. Uh, we're going to start off pretty lightly with uh, some very basic details on uh, the different types of binoculars out there. Eight and 10 are the most common magnifications, um, but I think it's pretty common knowledge that they have different advantages in different contexts. So maybe could you talk uh, the audience through when you might want an eight as opposed to a 10 or vice versa? Sure. Um, it's, a, it's an ongoing debate and it's a very personal sort of preference. Um, we find um, in certain parts of the world, um, eight times magnification or more popular. For example, I think in Europe, uh, where, the, where the light is not as, as bright as that we have here, um, eight is more popular there. Here in South Africa, we found our most popular is the 10 times because the 10 times having that little bit of extra magnification um, is, is sometimes quite nice, especially on those wide open plains or when the, when the birds are a little bit further away. It's, it's nice to have that bit of extra magnification. Um, it's easier to hold an eight times magnification steady. It doesn't, because every um, every little vibration or every bit of movement is magnified by the amount or the, or the strength of your binocular. So a 10 times binocular shakes a lot more than an eight times binocular. But generally, uh, one or the other, I would suggest a 10 if you're birding in South Africa. Now, when we're talking about extending the lifetime of our binoculars, um, it's certainly important to to take good care of your pair and make sure that you you aren't going to be causing any damage and you're keeping them clean etc so what are some of your uh, binocular maintenance tips for the birders out there do not use your t-shirt to clean lenses <laughs> <laughs> number one number two is please don't use your t-shirt to clean your lenses <laughs> 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 the uh so the the external lenses have got uh hard coatings on them but still the, we're talking about optical glass here and fairly sensitive uh coatings and if you've got dust or sand or grit on there and you use your t-shirt to rub it in that's sandpaper that's it's a disaster for lenses please don't do that if you're in the bush and you've got like some peanut butter sandwich on your lens blow it off and then lick it off i know it sounds kind of gross but once you get used to this you just you can lick off your lenses and then use a microfiber cloth to to polish it off and but <laughs> this i learned from our like head uh head coatings engineer because the tongue is actually quite soft and all the enzymes in there just get rid of everything it's that's the if you're in the field, that's the best way to clean your lenses and then a microfiber cloth to just to polish them. <laughs> uh, I think after this webinar, next time I go birding, it's uh, it's still not going to be, it's still going to be a weird sight to see birders licking their binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> not saying you have to do that, but <laughs> it's, it's a good trick for the forest. <laughs> okay, uh, you heard it here first, folks. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for your time thank you for participating and supporting the bird fair and uh yeah, thank you for lending your expertise mm. pleasure thank you for having us andrew thank you andrew
Yeah, so I don't know about you two, but I'd, I'd never heard about this licking your lenses business. No, me neither. And I certainly no. didn't see you licking your lenses in Mozambique, Mr. Vlock. <laughs> so clearly still got to take that plunge. <laughs> I've got some filthy, filthy lenses. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, um, thanks, thanks to Dale and Andrew for, for giving us their time. It always is great to uh, build on people's expertise and, and learn some, some lessons from people who are literally at the coalface of the development of the world's best optics. So incredible to have their expertise as part of the there. Absolutely. And I think that debate about eight versus 10, I'm certainly in the, the firm 10 by camp. I love having that extra bit of magnification, but my parents quite enjoy having a slightly wider field of view to play with, um, not using their binoculars as frequently as I do. I think it is a little bit more forgiving when it comes to trying to keep those lenses locked on a bird flitting around the canopy. But I think often there can often be this barrier for people who sort of think being a birder requires you to have the most expensive camera gear, the most expensive binoculars, the latest, greatest, biggest scopes you can get your hands on. And I think there's definitely this perception that birding can be quite a luxurious hobby. But there's a lot of work being done to try and bring birding back to a, an almost grassroots level, get people looking at the birds in their garden. Those are relatively close. You don't necessarily need amazing optics to get a look at those kinds of birds. And I certainly think, uh, Christina, your next speaker is someone who's doing just that and bringing bird watching into everyday life. Absolutely. Uh, so we profiled Sandy Swakula, who most, uh, if anyone's on social media, you'll you'll know that she has come to fame on Facebook um, through posting her lovely photos and stories about the birds that she sees in her small village in the Eastern Cape. So she lives with her granny and the chickens who often feature in her, in her Facebook posts. And she's built up quite a following and I think uh, has encouraged a lot of people to, to appreciate the birds in their gardens a lot more and, and has provided, especially in the lockdown, um, a lot of entertainment and inspiration to people. So BirdLife South Africa CEO Mark Anderson had a conversation with Sandy Swa and uh, asked her some questions about how she got into birding, uh, her favorite birds, and, and went through some of the, the photos that she's taken and the stories that go with them. But tell us a little bit about when you developed your interest in nature. I mean, I'm fascinated by your, your Facebook posts. I and mean, clearly you're passionate about nature and conservation. When did you develop this interest? Um, I would like to say uh, I grew up with it because I grew up with my grandfather. I grew up with both my grandparents on my dad's side. And growing up, we had goats, we had chickens, we had uh, dogs, cats, like everything, cows. Um, so I grew up herding with my grandfather because uh, my dad was the only son and they had all daughters. So we had to be helping out somehow. And growing up, I had to be there with the goats in the crawl. I had to be there with the dogs helping out everything. So I think my love for nature started from there because I was surrounded by it from a very early age. I didn't know that I could study and make it as fine as I'm making it now until I got to varsity. And that's when my spectrum was opened up for birds and, and everything else because I just grew up with livestock. So I would like to think that growing up is how I got introduced to it. And then when I moved for varsity, it's when I actually found out that I could make it a career and I could make it something that I enjoyed other than being a chore when I was at home. So yeah, it's it's just how I lived all my life, I guess. <laughs> Um, so, hey, Deesway, yeah. so you've had an interesting career. And if, well, if you know, you've worked at the Botanical Gardens in Stellenbosch, and you worked at Mountain Zebra National Park. Is that correct? Yes. Because I was wondering about the various things you've done, and you you shared your CV with me, and I could see you've you've done some really exciting things. But in your in your during your responsibilities at the garden and at the park, I mean, can you, are there any? specific tasks that you had that you thought, you know, were really fun. I mean, kind of things that you thought, well, this is really nice. This is why I'm so pleased I'm pursuing a career in nature conservation. Um, funny enough, I've never been a fan of public speaking <laughs> because I, I tended to have a stutter whenever I had to have a group of people listening to me. Um, but when I was at the garden and, and, and we had to do uh, environmental education for school children, and because I was one of the few people who could be 
uh, used on ad hoc basis on, 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 on a lot of things, I ended up being part of the EE programs. And watching those kids learn about everything that we take for granted because we work there was the best part for me. Because now you just give them a talk and they're like, oh yeah. And then, because if you do that to adults, they usually be like, okay, thank you, moving on to the next thing. But children have questions that sometimes you won't even understand that they know about. And for me, getting to watch them light up and they, I'm, I'm quite sure they felt the same way I felt when I was learning about um, um, ecology and everything when I was at varsity. And I'm happy every time they learn something at a tender age because I didn't get that growing up. I only learned about it when I got to varsity. So I think that was my main thing where in the beginning I was like, ah, maybe not, I'm gonna start her. But when you watch those kids, sponge up everything that you teach them it's the best feeling ever and i think that's one of the main things that i miss about mm -hmm. working outside of here it's the education part of small kids learning outside home so i think i miss that the most i mean what a, what a wonderful lady um, and what a great role model as well uh, we, we talk about uh, opening up the birding community to new demographics um, especially in this country people of color and women and yeah, we have such an amazing uh, lady sharing her experiences. But, you know, my, my favorite thing about Sandiswa is her, I think her heart is in just the right place. Um, she she watches the birds and, I mean, sure, she enjoys a new life and all of that. But, you know, she really paid attention to Lance and she watches the birds and then sees what they're doing and sees how they interact with the environment. And she just loves the birds for what they are. It doesn't matter if they if it's a... Cape White Eye in her garden or some exciting new woodpecker that she's seen. She just, she loves them all and she incorporates them into, into her daily life, which I just think is so great. Yeah, and I think that's, that's part of why people have responded so well is just her passion comes through in, in everything that she, she posts um, on Facebook and you can just tell that she's spent time watching these birds to get the photographs. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just a joy and I think brings a lot of pleasure to people's lives. Absolutely. I think that raw passion is something that's so infectious when you meet birders. I mean, we really, we're, we're crazy about birds. <laughs> that's not a, an inaccurate description of any of us. We absolutely love them. And I think Sandiswa is just such a pure joy when she interacts and talks about birds. And I think it's, it's really done a lot to showcase birding as a hobby to a whole range of new people who maybe hadn't encountered it before. And she really is a, a champion of birds and birding and all power to her. I hope her following keeps growing on social media and that we continue to work with her to keep championing, bringing more birders into the flock from all over South Africa. Yeah. I think in terms of spreading the gospel of birding, um, there's one particular name from the fair that comes to mind, Melissa, uh, David Lindo. Absolutely. What a man. And yeah. uh, Christina's going to introduce him shortly. But I have to just say one of my absolute favorite moments of David Lindo. And I'm not sure if we've got it in the next clip. Christina will let us know in a moment. But uh, he talks about encountering these young gentleman sitting on top of his car being in a park and uh, he'd gone out birding in one of his home home patches and came back to his car and here were these sort of young riffraff teenagers sitting on his car kind of saying yo man what are you doing and uh, he saw this as an opportunity instead of being annoyed and saying get off of my car he said all right let's let's go into these guys corner and, and sort of talk to them about birding on their terms he handed one of them a pair of binoculars and said you see those swifts up there I want you to see if any of you can try and keep up with any of those swifts and keep them in your binocular vision for more than 10 seconds and turned it into this whole cool kind of video game approach to birding and these boys were absolutely hooked on this activity and I think that is just such an incredible mechanism that someone like David Lindo is bringing to birding and getting more and more people into birds in urban areas. So Christina over to you to introduce what you've got prepared for us. Yeah, so for those who, who aren't familiar with David Lindo, he is a, a British birder. He's the, the urban birder. Um, he's a broadcaster and presenter and tour leader. Um, and he's been birding from, I think he was before he could walk um, and, and is a naturalist, really. Uh, so he, he gave one of our keynote presentations and he shared stories about how he got into birding as a young boy, um, he didn't have any 
influential role models, but he still developed this passion for birds. And then he, in his presentation, he took the audience through four of his favorite urban patches in London, in Spain, Taiwan, and Serbia. After his presentation, he had a conversation with our CEO, Mark Anderson, and BirdLife South Africa board member, Hali Boy Modi Sakori. So, so David, you, your, your notion of, of the urban birder is quite contrarian. Uh, now, now from that, how, how would you advise us in South Africa with urbanization being quite uh, the prevalent concept uh, to get into bedding in the urban area, uh, particularly in South Africa? Um, I think it's all about, I mean, South Africa, you know, is a fantastic country for nature. Um, but people, not only in South Africa, but in the world, have it in their heads that you can only see nature outside of an urban area. And I think a lot of people don't get to go outside of an urban area because they live in wherever they live. So I think, you know, it's, it's to get people to, I think it's more of a holistic thing, to get people to actually understand that they can get in touch with nature where they live. And that by getting in touch with nature, by con connecting with nature, it basically allows you to, to, to kind of be feeling grounded. It kind of, I mean, we all know it's good for our well-being, so it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to, to connect with, to, to, to get sort of plugged into because, you know, it's free, it's, it's on your doorstep, and it's amazing when you actually start looking as to what you can actually discover. Now, I talk about this subject around the world, and I think now that I've got my, I mean, I'm not giving it a plug for, you know, deliberately, but now that I'm trying to develop a community, um, the Urban Birder World Membership, I think that community will grow into a situation where people can see it as a resource to find out, you know, how do I go about this? Or to think about maybe I can set up something based on what's happened in New York, you know, you can set up walks or use a, the template that we have to get people involved. So for me, it's, it's, it's a movement. And when I first kind of started talking about being, or talking about urban burning, which was again, 16 years ago, my first hurdle was to overcome this whole thing about there's no birds in the city. Um, so what I tried to do was to sell it to the media as a lifestyle choice. Do this like yoga or meditation and stuff like that, you know, sell it as that. And when you sell it that way, it doesn't have that connotation it used to have where, you know, you think of oh, bird washing, that sounds boring. You know, you make it, you reinvent it and you make it feel very kind of contemporary and this is something you need to get involved with. And I've noticed over the years how people who had no interest previously are now saying, oh, actually, I like watching birds down again, especially during lockdown, you know, during this pandemic people have connected quite well with uh, nature because it's no longer seen as being the pastime of the few you know anyone can do it and it makes you feel great so to me it's a win-win situation and take care don't forget keep looking up i think i chose that clip because i just like the fact that he em emphasizes that you can have nature nature doesn't have to be out out there it can be around you all the time and to again pay attention to what's what's immediately around you and above you i think the the national lockdown and the subsequent growth and people interested in, in mm. birds in particular is such a an indication of that i mean i had i had friends and, and family friends calling me and whatsapping me regularly asking, oh, I've seen this bird in my garden. Of course, they're not. Nature, nature is restricted to their back gardens and they're suddenly noticing these birds coming in. What are they? And they start kind of, they buy a bird book and, you know, when lockdown eased, maybe they, they, they were more aware of what was going on around them. But this nature has been all around them all the time uh, in their gardens and they just started to notice it now during lockdown. So I think this concept of urban birding definitely has um, a place. And as I said, we grew a whole new generation of birders during lockdown. Well, um, we had one of Africa's most experienced birders chatting to us at the bird fair. Uh, I set Dr. Callum Cohen the um, difficult task, I think, of 
putting together a talk on Africa's most sought after birds. As you'll see now, Callan's one of the most experienced tour leaders around Africa. And he was actually uh, partially the reason why I'm here at BirdLife. Um, I had an opportunity when I was a student uh, to work part time as a bird guide for Callan. So um, that's kind of set me up to take over this AV tourism project. So I'm grateful to Callan for the role that he's played in, in my birding career and uh, my extended career outside of that. And uh, he gave a really great presentation on some really tantalizing species. So I've uh, clipped out his introduction and also his account on African fitter, which I think is uh, arguably one of South Africa's most sought after birds, if not the most sought after birds. I've been leading bird watching tours through Birding Africa for over the last 24 years, traveling all around Africa, from South Africa to East Africa, to Ethiopia, across to West Africa. And it's something that I do think about quite a lot, like what are Africa's most sought after birds? What birds do people want to see? And what birds capture my own imagination? And I've realized it's actually quite a hard question to answer. Um, we've got about 2,800 species of birds in Africa. A lot of really spectacular birds, a lot of birds that are only found in Africa that people do want to see. And so, in fact, many, many, many of Africa's birds are sought after. And how does one come up with a list to go through in more detail? It was certainly much harder than I thought. Um, and I, I think being spectacular certainly helps. Um, but I think also being rare and difficult to find also helps. Um, birds that are most sought after tend to be birds that aren't necessarily very easy to see, that people might try to see multiple times and not see. Um, have to go to very particular places, employ very particular strategies. And so I'm just going to share my thoughts on what I think some of the more interesting ones are um, with you. Certainly, um, one of the birds that captured my imagination and I know has captured lots of other people's imaginations across Africa is the African pitta. It used to be called the Angolan pitta. And in many ways, pittas have captured people's imagination all around the world. I mean, uh, we know about Chris Goody's book, The Jewel Hunter, all about trying to see all the world's pitters in a year. Pitters are really special. They're very secretive birds. They've got amazing colors, but they're also very, very difficult to see. They're very, very secretive and they tend to need to be, you need to, you know, things have to be just right in order to, in order to see them. African pitters are no exception. It's an extremely beautiful bird with red and electric blue. And despite these colors can remain mostly unseen as it sort of shuffles around in the leaf litter in, in dense thickets and becomes really difficult to see. And, and certainly when I started birding or started getting more into birding, African pitta was seen as a bit of a holy grail of birds to find, really difficult birds in, in Southern Africa especially. It uh, was best known then from the Zambezi Valley up in the far north of the subregion. You had to get your timing just right. And if I put up a little map below, some of you will recognize that this is a map from eBird. The records are most concentrated still in this area around the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia. And that is definitely the best area to go and find them. And, but finding African pitta does require a bit of knowledge about the bird's habits. And in some ways, it's quite an interesting species because it's, it tells us quite a bit about what's happening in Africa as a whole. Yeah, so Callan, I mean, it's pretty evident from just that small clip, the incredible amount of insight he has into birds and their ecology and their habitats. Uh, and I, I can foresee people watching that over and over on our YouTube channel, deciding where next they want to go in Africa. I don't know about you two, but I'm just so pumped now to go and explore some new African countries. Absolutely. And as someone who still needs the African pitta on their life list, I'm simply drooling at the prospect of getting out to see that incredible bird and all the other amazing avifauna that we have on this incredible continent of ours. Africa does have a huge diversity of bird species, but unfortunately, there's also a huge diversity of threats. And many African species are threatened with extinction. Dr. Hazel Thompson is the Global Director for Partnership, Capacity and Community at BirdLife International. And he has over 40 years of experience in conservation in Africa. He gave an interesting talk where he reflected on bird conservation over the last 20 years in Africa. And it was based on 
uh, papers that he had done, he'd written in 2001, looking at the bird conservation issues back then. And this talk updated them and looked at the progress that has been made. So in this clip, you'll see him giving the a summary at the end of his talk of uh, where the challenges lie and what needs to be done, as well as highlighting a few successes. Yeah, no. Simple, no magic bullets, but amazing progress had been made in some areas, but significant challenges remain. No doubt the biodiversity loss continues, but sound like a continuing threat. I've set out some thoughts there. I won't go through all of them because some of them are longstanding um, thoughts. Um, I'll highlight just a few. I feel that greater use of local knowledge at every level, and perhaps significantly the use of local local technologies, local languages in technologies like bird apps, like bird books, bird guides. I think that would make a good. Fourth and six points are related. Um, we need open access, not only for data and projects and initiatives going on, but we need to have systems in which um, information or data can be put in at various levels from the individuals to the site, to the landscape uh, uh, level. And everyone can see what's going on, where the data is, et cetera. Some systems are starting to do that, like the Africa Brother Atlas Project and, and others. Uh, I, I know are being developed around forest conservation, et cetera, et cetera. And, but I think four and six um, have great potential for boosting the way we do bird conservation in Africa, I thought I'd put up a slide on what bird conservation success looks like. Um, no need to go into all of this, but I wanted to pay tribute to the amazing organizations and individuals doing such great work across the continent. Despite the issues and the challenges and the problems, not least the recent pandemic, I say recent, it's still ongoing, not least the coronavirus pandemic. People have been doing amazing work and thanks to all of those who are continuing to do this work in the face of all these challenges. What, a, what an unbelievable privilege to have someone like Dr. Hazel Thompson share his wealth of knowledge and experience with us. And it is thanks to people like him who've really laid the mainstream and I must really commend the BirdLife International Partnership for all they've done to drive conservation across this beautiful continent and certainly the three of us sitting here and the amazing organization that we work for is very are very proud to be part of that partnership. But moving on to what Hazel touched on briefly in his clip there, it certainly goes without saying that all of the conservation work we do could not be achieved without the incredible science-based research that is taking place across the continent. And one of the absolute leaders in some of this ornithological work has got to be the Fitzpatrick Institute at the University of Cape Town. And we are extremely proud of the affiliation that we hold with this world-class academic institution. And to tell you a little bit about the work that's been going on there, we welcome the illustrious Professor Peter Ryan to share with you some of the insights into the ongoings of the Fitzpatrick Institute. Welcome to the African Bird Fair. I'm Peter Ryan, director of the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. Africa is renowned as being the cradle of humankind and is unique in being the only continent with a mostly intact megafaunal community. This is because Africa was largely spared the mass extinction of large animals that accompanied the spread of hominids out of Africa. Africa also boasts an impressive diversity of birds. One quarter of all birds occur in Africa and its adjacent islands, with close to 2,000 species found nowhere else. In addition to this high level of species richness, Africa also is home to 27 endemic bird families, more than 10% of all families and three of 40 bird orders are found nowhere else on Earth. In order to effectively conserve this rich avian heritage, 
We need to understand how African birds are coping in the face of unprecedented global change. This is the main goal of the Fitzpatrick Institute at the University of Cape Town. Established in 1960 by Dr. Cecily Niven to commemorate her father, Sir Percy Fitzpatrick, the author of Jock of the Bushveld, the Fitz Institute is recognized as a national center of excellence using birds as keys to biodiversity conservation. Our research focuses on understanding and conserving biodiversity. And one of our flagship courses is the Conservation Biology MSc program, which has been training the next generation of conservation leaders from all over the world for the past 30 years. Today, 10 of our students will present aspects of their research, which will give you a flavor of the wide range of topics covered at the FITS. I'm sure you'll find them interesting. If you'd like to learn more about our research, please visit our website and download copies of our informative annual reports. I just want to you know, throw it out there that a lot of the uh, employees now at uh, BirdLife South Africa are uh, alumni of the FITS. I know there's two of us on this panel mm. and many more than spread across the staff with various masters and doctorates that they graduated from the FITS. So again, an, an organization that we do deeply value our connection with and are actually integral to our work in terms of informing uh, what we do and how we do it. Absolutely. And I think last week's episode really showcased the high quality of research that is coming out of the FITS. Uh, Kalen Pariachi presented his PhD research on the webinar series last week. Those of you who were with us would have seen just how incredibly high standard this level of research is and a, certainly a very exciting future for ornithology in Africa with students coming out of the Fitzpatrick Institute. So talking about bird nerds and people who uh, are deeply engrossed in the birding world and the world of ornithology, uh, we held the second ever wind down quiz at the end of the second day of events. Um, I hosted it last year and was uh, asked for better or worse to reprise my role, so I did so. Uh, I took on uh, co-hosting duties this year along with David Wilson, who is the director of Participate, the company who helped us host it on this uh, virtual platform. So he stepped in and together we ran the second ever wind down quiz, dubbed the biggest bird quiz in Africa. I don't know if anyone's ever actually quantified that, but uh, I think it's a fairly safe assumption. And yeah, we ran things a little differently this year. Last year was uh, a little less interactive and, and this year we, we used a different platform and I think it was quite a lot of fun and uh, very interesting. I think everyone learned something. So I hope you enjoy these little snippets here uh, of the wind down quiz. And the first question in three, two, one is, Name. Andrew, you're going, to you're going to read this out. All righty, so you've got to choose from one of these four options. You have 10 seconds. This is a Cape Rock Jumper, male or female, Drakensberg Rock Jumper, male or female. Type that answer Three, in. If you watch Alan Lee's, there we 51, go. 51 responses in, and let's have a look and see. 48 of you would be correct. I answered option E, so I got it wrong. <laughs> so if you watch Alan Lee's uh, presentation today, you have no excuse. Right, let's have a look here and let's use in the top. Okay, there's our points. And Mayo, hopefully I pronounced it right, got it in the fastest, only just ahead of Helena. Um, so that's looking pretty good. So that's how it works, ladies and gentlemen. The next uh, leaderboard we will show after question number five. Right, question number five. I'll read this one out, give it a bash. Fastest fingers first, fingers on the buttons. Let's go. Name this bird. Well, that's not a pterodactyl either. Looks like it's swimming in the sea, potentially. Black-browed albatross, shy albatross, wandering albatross, or a waved albatross. So it's possibly an albatross. 51 answers in, and the correct answer is a shy albatross. All right, 51 answers in, and let's have a look at the leaderboard and see um, who was at first? It was Mayo, then followed by Yelena, if I thought, if I remember correctly. Wow, so Mayo, you have maintained your lead. Congratulations. Only just though, only a couple of split seconds in it. Joel, welcome to the leaderboard there. And Cameron, number 13 is. 
what is the name of the bird in Snoopy? Wow. So all the millennials and baby boomers should know this. Um, your Gen Ys, Gen X. Yeah, um, the Gen Xs should also know this. There was a very popular cult-like movement and event in the US with a similar name, or the same name as this. Bird. Oh, you're giving it away now, David. Come on. <laughs> it still doesn't help still doesn't help the youngsters i'm not sure how many youngsters we have on this call oh tweety close but no cigar woodstock is the right answer hopefully quite a few of you got that right and it is what is the national bird of mauritius this is a multiple choice so choose carefully is it the mauritius white eye which is depicted here. And am I bluffing you or double bluffing you by putting it as a picture? Who knows? Is it the pink pigeon, the Mauritius kestrel or the dodo? I have one of these on my desk, not a real dodo, but a glass one. There we go. Most people fell for my scheme of putting the Mauritius white eye as the picture. It was in fact the dodo, it's their national bird. So let's just have a look and see. Click through to the final scoreboard. Are you ready ladies and gentlemen? Here we go. Well done to Mayer with 22,383 points. Well done, everyone. Uh, fantastic quiz. Thank you so much for playing along. And thank you so much to my co-host, David, for uh, making it so interactive and fun this year. St stepping in at the last minute. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was great fun, Andrew. I think we could probably do this again. Yeah, I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, and of course, segueing out of the fit session, uh, Mayer being... Uh, the UCT student and, and very well acquainted with the fits. I think he had maybe an unfair advantage, but um, sterling performance there and well done to Mayer for winning this year's bragging rights. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very fun. Um, the, the time limits made it quite stressful. <laughs> Absolutely, and trying to click the right image at the right time as quickly as you could often led to some really nasty mistakes and yeah. points lost. So I think there were a few expletives hurled at computer screens. I certainly, for one, was occasionally missing points for silly finger errors, but it was a hell of a lot of fun. And Andrew, I think you and David have set the benchmark for future bird quizzes. That was absolutely such a blast. And well done to you and David for putting together such a fun event in literally, I think, two hours preceding to that uh, live event. So well done to both of you. Yeah, well, credit to David there. Um, he's the the brains behind all the interactive uh, stuff. So I just set the questions and did the nerdy stuff. Uh, David made it all happen. So thanks to thanks to David and his team, not only for the quiz, but uh, really hosting such a wonderful platform and making the whole virtual experience possible. Yes, absolutely. All credit to the Participate team. What an unbelievably slick and technologically incredible platform we had to use at this year's Virtual African Bird Fair. And as the wind down quiz wrapped up the Virtual African Bird Fair, we are now going to wrap up our highlights reel with what is probably one of the top speakers we were privileged enough to have at this year's Virtual African Bird Fair. And I have to say, it was such an honor and a privilege to be on a panel with two of my personal conservation heroes. Martin Harper is the Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia at BirdLife International. And he was assisting me to give an interview to Chris Packham, who is one of the top global broadcasters when it comes to natural history through the BBC platform, showcasing shows like Spring Watch, Autumn Watch and Winter Watch. And he's undoubtedly been dubbed the next David Attenborough, and he certainly did not disappoint in this interview. I've just snipped out the final sentiments which I asked Martin and Chris to provide during this incredible discussion that we had talking all things birding in Africa, conservation at a global scale, everyday bird watching activities. And I have to just say these last two sentiments from both of these gentlemen were undoubtedly two of my favorite comments that they made throughout our interview. And hopefully we can find a way to share Chris and Martin's interview with all of you who weren't able to watch at the bird fair. We'll try and figure out a way to do that. But I hope that you'll enjoy these closing sentiments from these gentlemen as we wrap up our virtual African bird fair highlight. Uh, just to say this is the most important decade ever. Uh, it's meant to be the UN decade of ecological restoration. We're gonna get a global deal on nature, a global, deal on climate change, hopefully, but in the end, Chris's messages about all of us basically stepping up 
to do a play our part is the most important thing. But it's this decade, guys. Come on, roll up the sleeves. Yeah, I think Martin's hit the nail on the head. This is uh, this is the point where we determine our future on this planet and and the way that that impacts on on the rest of the planet all of those millions perhaps even billions of species that are, are, are out there um we could fail and life is tenacious and you know something else will happen and it will be biologically interesting and we won't be here to see it um but what does that say about us as a species you know one of the most intelligent um adaptable resourceful you know animals the most intelligent adaptable and resourceful species that's ever lived on this planet um if we fail um frankly how grotesquely embarrassing that would be I, I i i don't want to fail i want us all to come together and succeed for the very simple reason that we can so let's just um get on with it yeah melissa firstly i think you did a fantastic job uh interviewing chris uh, along with martin well done I can see that you were enjoying yourself and uh, absorbing this incredible opportunity that uh, was made available. And I, I just agree. I think incredible sentiments from the both of them, great challenges to us as conservationists and also people who are just interested in nature and loving nature and to, to make the changes necessary to, to make sure that uh, nature and birds continue to thrive for, for many, many generations. And, and that's what Bird Life South Africa is in this fall. So a wonderful way to finish up our virtual African Bird Fair highlights. And I think all that's left to say is thank you to the various people that were involved, the organizing committee that put it together, you, uh, those of you who managed to attend on the day and interact with us and take part in the Bird Fair, all of our exhibitors, our auction item donors, our various uh, platinum, gold and silver sponsors, all of our speakers, it was an incredible day a massive team effort, uh, so many moving parts and so many people giving their time um, to us to make it a big success. So a wonderful day. I hope you've enjoyed our compilation of some of the, the best of the Bird Fair and we look forward to seeing you at the African Bird Fair 2022. Thanks everyone. Sure, that was unbelievable and I, I can't quite believe just how much we managed to pack into that hour-long Highlights Reel, Andrew, Christina, well done to both of you. I know we had a lot of fun putting that together and I hope everybody tuned in, enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed putting it together for all of you. We won't show you the bloopers reel, but uh, it certainly was, was a lot of fun just reliving the bird fair and getting to watch some of those absolutely phenomenal presentations. So thanks to the two of you for all your hard work in choosing your best segments. And based on the, the comment feeds, I think everybody's really enjoyed some of the highlights we've put together. So with that, just a reminder to everybody, we do have our usual post webinar survey. So please do just uh, pop your comments in there and let us know what you thought of tonight. It was something a little bit different and uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. And please do give us your feedback, be it positive or negative. Uh, we do enjoy some constructive criticism to ensure that we are bringing you the best show that we can. So thanks to everyone who always gives us their two cents worth. It is appreciated and we do try and take note of that. And I see next week's speaker is tuned in. Andrew, would you mind uh, telling us a little bit about what people can expect next week in our Sand Park series? Sure, Melissa. Yeah, as you just mentioned, we're carrying on our birding uh, theme. Uh, we've been having a new destination feature within the Sand Parks Network every month. The first Tuesday of every month for the last six months or so has been dedicated to a sand parks national park and next month we have the Agalas national park it's an area i've spent a lot of time in and as you say dr um, vim de clerc is in the audience tonight hello vim welcome and uh, we are very much looking forward to hearing from you and of course some of you who did attend the uh, hidden gem south african birding destinations uh, session at the bird fair will recognize vim he did a shortened version of what we can expect next week uh, and if you did tune into that, uh, you will know that BIM is um, exceptionally, if not um, potentially dangerously passionate about the Agalas National Park area. Um, he, he, it really is his local stakeout, and I'm really looking forward to hosting him next week. Yeah, it should be a, a fun one and an interesting one. Um, that's an area that I go quite often, so 
looking forward to some tips. Um, so we do have uh, one question actually from Penny Abbott this evening and uh, she's addressed it to you Andrew but I think it's something that we all need to think about and, and bird life needs to to kind of take on and that's how do you think that bird life South Africa can build on the growing interest in birding after lockdown? Yeah it's a great question thanks Penny and um Maybe I'll just wax lyrical for a bit before I actually answer the question. Uh, I think, you know, that, that, that growth in people's natural interest during lockdown um, was really something to behold. Uh, I think there were a few different elements to it, of course, being stuck to our backyards in terms of our engagement with nature for, what was it, six weeks at level five, and then um, we were only allowed six to nine in the mornings. For those of you outside of South Africa, I mean, we had a very very stringent national lockdown for quite an extended period. So people started noticing the birds coming into their gardens and um, it, it became a gateway for people to engage with the natural world. And they started to notice what was actually around them the whole time, but um, they were forced to by the national lockdown. And the, the second facet of why people became more uh, in, aware of nature and the environment was because of the origins of the pandemic. Uh, unless you believe that it was created in the lab, the uh, overall kind of consensus is that this was a zoonotic disease and it's created this new awareness about how animals and humans interact in our environments and how um, diseases uh, can uh, come out of situations where things are taken too, too far to the extreme um, and things are not taken care of and nature is not taken care of. So... You know, people are more aware of nature and, and particularly birds because of the reasons I've already said. And it is something that we need to harness. And I'm going to throw it slightly back to Penny. Um, Penny is the chair of the uh, Bird Life in Kwasi Club, as I believe. And um, I think our, our 41 affiliated bird clubs across the country have the unique position of, of being representatives in the communities and having fingers in the communities and, and having influence. And picking up on that new appreciation of nature and awareness of the environment around people and getting your, your, your name out there, that there are like-minded communities around and encouraging people to join those is a great idea. So I think the bird clubs have a big role to play in that. Bird life is, I see it more as a, a, an umbrella kind of um, effect over the whole thing. But of course, with the establishment of the Listers Club, uh, South Africa Listers Club in February 2020, we were trying to encourage exactly this, uh, people getting in, in, involved in birds and birding and, and general, and using that as a gateway to more general environmental awareness. Of course, we, we don't conserve birds in isolation. We, we acknowledge and celebrate that they are part of a broader system which supports us uh, as humans. So um, I think the establishment of the Listless Club was quite timely. And I think now that we've got our milestone pin badges out, I really hope a lot of you will uh, get involved and enjoy the challenge and um, the whole growth factor of going up through your milestones and hopefully with the launch of our new AV tourism hub which I'm not going to give away too much on now but we we are taking everything online and updating everything and we're going to have a, an incredible interactive tool uh, for AV tourists uh, locally and foreign visiting uh, hopefully by the end of the year or early next year um, so hopefully that also inspires people to go out and explore and makes information available for people, which enables the growth of birding and harnessing, as you say, Penny, um, to actually answer your question, the growth in the interest in birds and birding in South Africa. So there's a long winded answer for you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andrew. And I think you've made some really valid points there. And I am conscious that... Uh, we are very much over time for tonight's webinar, but given the, the unique nature of this one, I hope everyone will forgive us that. And uh, I think with that, Ted, I do see your question about Lisbeth Park. You can pop me an email and I'll, I'll email you an answer to that. But uh, just in the interest of time tonight, I think we need to uh, wrap things up. I'll let the closing slides play for a couple of minutes while we play out the beautiful tunes by Herman Bergman. But Andrew, Christina, thank you. And I'm going to give you each a gap just to uh, say your closing sentiments before we wrap up for this evening. Andrew, go for it. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, Melissa, that a couple of people have been asking about watching these presentations in full. And they are now live on our YouTube channel. So if you look up BirdLife South Africa on YouTube, 
and you look at our YouTube channel, all of those public talks or the non-paid talks uh, will be available there. Um, those include most of the presentations we showed tonight. There were a few paid presentations, so we had three workshops and two keynotes. Of course, we don't want to uh, release those publicly if people have paid for them. That's not really fair on the people that uh, paid to listen to the talk. So everything that wasn't paid to listen to is available on YouTube. And thanks to both of you for a very uh, fun evening and uh, fun process putting all that together. Christina, yeah. any closing sentiments? Um, not, not much, just to say thank you uh, to everyone for listening and, and people that we did forget to thank in our, in our video were the actual speakers who, who presented such amazing talks and, and allowed the bird fair to be the great success that it was. So yes, thank you very much to all of them. Uh, and of course the, the committee who put it all together and thanks to the audience for listening and please join us next week. Absolutely. Thank you both. Thanks everyone who was involved in the bird fair, sponsors, exhibitors, speakers, all the bird life team. Well done. I think tonight really just highlights what a fun event it was. And uh, we look forward to virtual or not so virtual bird fair 2022. Watch this space. We'll let you know what's happening as soon as we've made a decision. But thanks so much for joining us tonight, everyone. It's been another great conservation conversations episode. And you can catch it on YouTube if you missed anything or want to rewatch anything from tomorrow. And with that, keep your eyes on the skies, keep enjoying those birds, and we'll be back with you same time, same place next week, Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Good night, everybody, and keep safe. <laughs>